Shalom to everyone, all our viewers around the globe. This is TV7 with the Middle East Review here in Jerusalem. With me today is Mr. Amir Oren, one of the most senior Israeli uh, journalists, a publisher, a writer, and uh, a columnist. And also his uh, expertise and uh, very good analysis on uh, geopolitical issues, uh, security issues, defense, and also some politics as well. Welcome, uh, Amir. May I leave now? It will be downhill from... Yes, it will be. Well, the, we'll let the viewers judge according to your uh, words of uh, wisdom or lack thereof. We'll see. Anyway, Amir, we are now here in Jerusalem, in Israel. This is the uh, 144th uh, day of the war. Uh, the war with the, started with the blitz by Hamas on the 7th of October with the most heinous uh, massacre, actually um, slaughtering more Jews in one day than ever before um, or after, than ever after the, uh, the, the Holocaust. Uh, Israel, of course, had to respond. And we are now, uh, after almost uh, four months, deep inside Gaza. But is there an exit strategy? What would you recommend? So it all uh, comes down to uh, what are your war aims, how realistic they are in the uh, time allotted to it, and uh, of course, uh, which is not subject to any one party's uh, sovereignty, sovereign decisions, many players uh, interact here. And there are also other considerations, of course, uh, seemingly extraneous to the war, but actually part of the larger regional picture. So when one looks uh, at Gaza, there are two other levels. In addition to the combat, one sees there both underground in the tunnels and above ground in Khan Yunus, Gaza City, other places, not yet in Rafa, perhaps there will not be a Rafa operation. And the two levels are, first of all, what is going to be the political solution out of which will the rest of the operations derive? And the second uh, level is what will happen in other fronts, on other fronts, Lebanon, Yemen, the Red Sea, uh, perhaps uh, spilling over to Iran, or its militias in Iraq. And of course, the West Bank, East Jerusalem. And of course, this is a constant concern for Israel, especially as we are approaching the holy month of Ramadan, where tensions always rise and uh, where there are provocations, both on the Arab and the Jewish uh, sides. There are people, especially fundamentalists, uh, who are keen on causing trouble during this particular time, each for their own uh, purposes. But as you said, this is a front, but we can concentrate on the political outline of what will happen, not uh, the day after or uh, the, uh, the next day. We should look uh, towards the future. Uh, it's a matter of years. One has to build up governance and the um, authorities, administration. So uh, why um, won't we uh, first deal with the uh, civilian and uh, governmental side of Gaza and then move to the other fronts? Yeah, but one of the concerns of Israeli government, and I would say most Israelis, is that um, Hamas will be defunct as a military force. So they will never be able to do another slaughter like that. And in order to do that, 
they say they still have, uh, you know, they had 24 battalions, 18 battalions, the IDF pretty much dismantled. There are six more, I guess two in the Dir el-Balakh area, which is the center of uh, the Strip, the Gaza Strip, and four in Rafa. Now, one would say that, you know, if you um, finish the war without getting into Rafa, it would be akin to someone who has a house in Florida and he's expecting a hurricane, hurricane coming, so he's boarding all his windows from all sides, except one side, which is just the, the direction of, of the wind. Are that you could, talking about Yair Netanyahu? Uh, <laughs> close, close enough. Okay. He's there, yes. You know, sometimes it's better not to get what we wish for. You uh, surely remember the uh, invasion of Lebanon in 1982. It was intended to destroy the uh, Palestine Liberation Organization, which has shelled the uh, Galilee. And the push it 40 kilometers from the border. No, at at to get at least to 40 kilometers um, of the border because this was artillery range. And uh, when uh, shells uh, were launched from 40 kilometers, they reached the northernmost communities in Israel. At least this was the declared uh, motive uh, for the invasion. And um, it succeeded. There were uh, many costs, there were many casualties, um, Israel uh, got bogged down, but the uh, declared war aim of kicking the PLO out of Lebanon um, was achieved. However, uh, instead of the PLO, we saw Hezbollah rising. First, Amal, uh, which was at the time the uh, most important Shiite organization, and then, slowly but surely, helped by Iran, Hezbollah. So um, let's assume that Hamas will be destroyed, even though, you know, when they say a battalion has been dismantled, what does it mean? If a battalion has a thousand um, armed men, we won't call them soldiers, but a thousand people who are carrying guns, and explosive. Armed terrorists, we call them. Okay. No, but the, the um, issue is uh, not uh, how you define them, but uh, what is the command and control mechanism. Right. So you manage to kill the battalion commander, his deputy, his operations, intelligence, and logistics officers, maybe some of the company commanders under the battalion commanders, and you have a ragtag mob of several thousand men, many thousand men. So they morphed into a guerrilla squads. That's one option. And the other option is that another new organization, which is not yet in existence, will come into being much like Al-Qaeda um, in the Arabian Peninsula morphed into something else, then we saw Daesh, sometimes Daesh fought with Al-Qaeda. ISIS, yeah. But, but uh, nevertheless, uh, you have the, the uh, human infrastructure there. Mm -hmm. If you have 2.4 million Palestinians, many, perhaps more than half of them, um, youth, unemployed, um, not uh, uh, very favorable of Israel, uh, to recruit them into a new organization, sons of Hamas, will not be difficult. So while this is good politically and uh, for um, a PR um, photo of someone saying, or not even saying, just gesturing this, but this may not be the V for victory. This may be the two, one Hamas and one sons of Hamas. So um, why uh, wouldn't we concentrate on the more achievable and more positive aims, namely to get both the Gaza Strip and the West Bank under a new improved management? It will still be called the Palestinian Authority. It will have a political horizon of 
Sometimes in the future, if conditions are met, it used to be called the roadmap. Under President George W. Bush, nothing came out of it. This was already 22 years ago. But the basic idea is still there. And we saw uh, on uh, uh, Tuesday, no, Monday of uh, this week, that uh, the uh, Palestinian Prime Minister, Shatia, has been asked and did offer his resignation to President Mahmoud Abbas in order for a new government, uh, which uh, will uh, administer both halves of the Palestinian Authority, because nominally the PA is still in charge of Gaza, even though they were kicked out some 17 years ago. So if this is the goal, then Rafa and the four battalions are less important. Well, Amir, I must say this is a very well-packed and reasonable uh, program. However, however, we are in the Middle East. However, and we are in the Middle East. Uh, let's say if we were dealing with the uh, Swiss people, maybe you would be right. But we have had that uh, experience, uh, experience before in 2005 when the same thing, you know, you were talking about uh, President Bush. He also talked about a new and reformed um, leadership of the Palestinians, understanding that everything was corrupt, supporting terror, incitement, and everything that goes the whole... I you say, were ambassador to Washington at the time. Yes, I was. And uh, at that time, the um, uh, Americans, with, uh, with Sharon was the prime minister, came with this brilliant idea. They will remove Arafat, right? He was the president. And we then created a new position. Prime Minister. They never had a Prime Minister of the Palestinian Authority. Who was the Prime Minister? Not, the not remove Arafat. He was still right. going to be there. Exactly. Right. Remove him from, let's say, the decision making. Day to day. Right. Just to kick him upstairs, as we say, you know, and uh, and put um, no other than Abbas. Not to create uh, the wrong impression, because Arafat died in November of uh, 2004, whether of natural causes or whether of what in the Middle East is considered natural causes? <laughs> well, just uh, maybe to uh, kind of uh, spread a little bit the, the mystery, I would say that the Palestinians have always uh, um, blamed maybe Israel on polonium, you know, one of those uh, spe spe special uh, radioactive uh, poisons. But the cause of death was never released by the French doctors, but there is more than an educated guess that he died out of AIDS. Anyway, but this is not the point. The point is that he was removed from power. Abu Mazen, no less than Abu Mazen, was the uh, the first prime minister, then became uh, president. Then Salam Fayyad. Then Salam Fayyad, now Ashtia. But the, 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 um, the, uh, I think the important thing is that there was no new and reformed leadership. Same uh, education system to hate Israel and the Jews. Same, um, I would say, blinking an eye for on, on terror. And we saw it all the way. But, but this is the relatively old Palestinian Authority, relatively uh, Middle Ages, um, if, not, if not before. And if we are concentrating on this past month, this, the last several weeks, and look ahead, we see that a couple of weeks ago, President Biden called on Prime Minister Netanyahu. And while the readout was, of course, uh, couched in diplomatic terms, they have talked. It was not uh, just a conversation. Biden read Netanyahu the riot act. And what we see now is that the hostilities in Gaza are grinding to a halt. There will be a deal. There will be an extended ceasefire. Maybe the war will resume later. But right now, as we are on the verge of Ramadan, this is probably going to be quite a pause, both in Gaza and uh, on the northern border, even though Israeli ministers already said that they will, they, that Israel will not be bound by a unilateral Hezbollah decision to stop fighting. 
Yeah, uh, well, um, Amir, we will touch on the northern border in, in, in a little bit, maybe towards the second half of the program, but let's stay in Gaza yet first. So, of course, everybody would like to have a good ceasefire, a long ceasefire, end of hostilities. Not everybody. The, the military perhaps will not. Right. They know that, they, that Israel has to get the hostages back, of but course. from a purely military uh, point of view, they would have liked to press on. And also what they recommend, and I think right now the government pretty much has a consensus, not just Bibi Netanyahu, but also Gantz and Eisenkot, which joined him for a quasi-national uh, unity uh, government. And they say, in any case, for the foreseeable future, after the cessation, let's say, of hostilities, the security issue will have to be under Israel. And here there is also a bad example. And you remember that, Amir, in 2006, elections in the Palestinian Authority. By the way, at that time I was also in Washington and I remember having quite a um, robust conversation, if not to say arguments. With Condoleezza Rice? With Condoleezza Rice, because they said, okay, let's, to, in, in order to create a, a real democracy, we have to have elections, everybody should, uh, should vote. And we said, okay, but look, Hamas is a, still is bent on the destruction of the state of Israel, has not changed its ways, and also it is armed. Where do you have elections? Where do you go with bullets to the ballots? And we gave an example of Bosnia. In Bosnia, before they had elections, there was a demand of a, um, a to disarm, to disarm. disarm. Yeah. They said, no, no, we always the Palestinians are the exception to our detriment and also to their detriment, I think, mostly to the Palestinian detriment. In any case, Hamas, of course, won the, uh, the elections in the parliament. And not only that, in Gaza, after less than a year, 2007, they, in a, in a, again, in a blitz, blitz uh, coup, they took over Gaza and they threw out uh, Fatah and uh, the, the Palestinian Authority. And Israel decided not to intervene. Absolutely. Because it could have. Absolutely. And until now, right, because, you know, it's always very uh, uh, tempting to keep a quiet, you know, always. This it's is not the that. First it's, option. It's, Israel was uh, right after a bloody campaign in Lebanon. Also. The government was weakened. The Olmert government was weakened both by corruption scandals and because the opposition headed by a certain Benjamin Netanyahu uh, attacked the government uh, for being incompetent. And the government uh, did not feel that uh, it is powerful enough to uh, go on a preventive world of sort. Because, because when Hamas uh, uh, kicked Fatah out, it did not do it as a launching pad against Israel. It was an inter-Palestinian development. And until now, they would like actually to replace the Fatah and be the uh, the ruling party in the Palestinian Authority. But Indeed. It's not, I would say that the default, always the default decision is inertia, to keep the quiet. You know, it's very tempting. It's very, I would say, addicting in you, a way. You don't have domestic support for a war of choice. Exactly. W once a disaster befalls you, then seemingly you must respond. But to initiate a war after several of Israel's wars, which did not come out as expected and as promised, it's, it's really uh, difficult. I know, in a, in a democracy, absolutely. In Israel. I, in Israel, for sure. Also in the United States and other democr democratic countries as well. But, uh, you know, you said that 2007, when Hamas took over, Israel was fatigued from the war of Lebanon, the Second Lebanon War. But even when Israel was not fatigued by war, two, May 2000, when Ehud Barak, as a prime minister, pulled out Israel from Lebanon altogether to the Blue Line, which is pretty much... Uh, parallel to the international uh, border. And even then, you know, from 2000 to 2006, Hamas violated every... Hezbollah. Uh, yes, I'm sorry, Hezbollah. And Israel did nothing until, of course, they, they, they attacked as well. Um, so when we talk about the aftermath, the, the, do you see any substitute to Israeli uh, security control over Gaza, because again, if we keep it to their own device, 
who would uh, guarantee that Hamas will not take over um, uh, the, the Fatah as they do, as they would uh, uh, have done in the West Bank had it not been for Israeli presence there. So again, several issues in one question. First of all, uh, what uh, do you consider security control? If uh, you're talking about flights by drones and aircraft over the Gaza Strip constantly and overwatch, of course, Israel would keep it along with the maritime boundary. The Israeli Navy will always patrol there. If you are talking about what happens on the border itself and even several hundred meters west of the border on the uh, so-called perimeter, of course. But Israel would not be able to have a presence inside Gaza, perhaps sometimes patrols, but not- Like a hot pursuit, like they, like they do now in Janine and Tulkara well, and all that's, this area. That's something else. If, if the, um, a Palestinian squad managed to penetrate uh, and the uh, IDF uh, would not be able to intercept it, either coming in or going right. Yes, of course, hot pursuit. This is even part of the Oslo um, exactly. agreement. But also here to preempt, let's say, if the IDF detects somebody uh, ready to launch a, a, a rocket to go and so, uh, preempt. So here, as a seasoned diplomat, you're going into the minute details of the agreement, which Israel is not going to sign with Hamas, but will sign with the mediators, especially the United States. Maybe what, Egypt. Maybe Egypt. And Egypt. What uh, would be considered a violation of the agreement, which would justify, let's say, an Israeli raid into Gaza? Will a terror act, as the one we had a few days ago at Maale Adomim, a terror act? performed by someone in the West Bank, not officially affiliated by Hamas, perhaps inspired by Hamas. Perhaps the letter he would uh, leave for uh, his uh, friends would say, uh, uh, I am uh, inspired by the example of the great Yahya Sinwar, who hopefully uh, would not uh, be among us, the living, uh, by that time. Could Israel see that as a justifiable reason to break the ceasefire in Gaza too? There are details here to, to be worked out. But um, when Israeli ministers speak about settling, resettling. Crazy. In Ga yes, but, but of course it's crazy. But, um, and when Netanyahu speaks about carving some strips north, south, East, in order for Israel to patrol there, the Biden administration comes out immediately and says no reduction in the size of Gaza. Okay, you mentioned also uh, kind of controlling what comes into Gaza, especially on the uh, shoreline. What about the Philadelphia Strip, which is facing Egypt, and through there, under brown tunnels, most of the illegal arms came into Hamas? So um, the problem there is uh, that Hamas is an offshoot of the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt. There is cooperation between these two branches across the border. Mm -hmm. There are also Bedouin tribes in the Sinai. The Sinai is where Rafa is bordering Egypt. And their age-old profession is smuggling. They do not recognize borders, customs, control. They don't care. This is how they make their living. And also, several of the Egyptian officers posted there work towards their retirement by keeping a blind eye um, over these problems. But there can be a creative solution, taking the multinational force and observers based in northern Sinai, near El Arish, and by mutual agreement between Israel and Egypt, commissioning it to patrol on the Egyptian side of the border. Now, they wouldn't like to open fire on smugglers or others if they see a camel 
um, with appliances, what are they going to do? But a technical solution can be found as long as there is political will. Yeah, the Bedouins, as you say, they do not uh, recognize or uh, international borders. They are, as we say, blowing with the wind in the dunes. Okay, well, now that we have solved the problem of Gaza, we did not solve it all because what about uh, de-radicalization of Gaza, how to make sure that, you know, the, the political culture changes, we can discuss it next time. We have just a few seconds to move into uh, Hezbollah, how do you see an um, end game over there? Well, it is said that uh, Lebanon is so mired in its uh, domestic, political, economical, and societal problems, and, and uh, Hezbollah is a major player there. Maybe it is better for Hezbollah from its own perspective, because Hezbollah is half Iranian and half Lebanese in its outlook. Maybe it is better for him to cease hostilities against Israel for now. They will never give up the fight. They are mukawama resistance, much like Hamas. But maybe uh, there is a possible agreement in which their Radwan force, their uh, 10,000 or so fighters um, who uh, are threatening the Israeli communities, those were from many Israelis uh, have been relocated, maybe they will take them back perhaps even unilaterally, and we will have a period of peace and quiet in which the IDF will be rebuilt in order to be ready for a resumption of the conflict, let's say, two years from now. Very interesting. Well, um, I would say that um, there is a UN Security Council resolution, um, 1701 from 2006, which ended the Second Lebanese uh, War, uh, the Lebanon War, and... uh, and under which they should not have been there from the first time. But again, this is something that is common. It in is the as East. good as resolution 2006 from 1701. Yes, yes. Well, in the Middle East, nobody abides by resolutions, unfortunately. Well, we didn't have much time. We will discuss it uh, further next month. Thank you very much for watching TV7 Middle East Review. to lose the young people. They want a vision. They want to see solutions which may help them to believe that there is a future for them. Are we succumbing in a slopery slope uh, road to the major crisis? I don't know. The key issue is, is leadership and also maybe a lack of national self-confidence.